is everything. The single most necessary element for any of us to sustain and live and thrive is water. I grew up in the Midwest, and I have a father who actually worked for industry, and he used to sing me songs all the time. Sometimes we'd be at the creeks, and he'd just make up little songs about, see that lovely water, you know, trickling down the spring. Don't take it for granted. Someday it might not be seen. He promised me in my lifetime that we would see water become more valuable than oil. He said, because there will be so little of it. I think that time is here. It's the third week in a row without any water. The army has been called in to protect the capital's water pumps. There's been a lot of talk about peak oil, when the production of oil reaches a peak and then inevitably starts to decline. Like peak oil, there is peak water. We're reaching the limits of what we can use. Once the fourth largest freshwater lake in the world, the Aral Sea has been diminished to about one-tenth its original size. The levels in Brazil's Amazon region reach record lows. Spain is in the grip of drought. The drought ravaging China's southwest is being called the worst. The worst in 40 years. Worst drought in 70 years. The worst in a century. Every region of the world is facing water problems, from China to the Middle East. Half the world's hospital beds are occupied by patients with waterborne diseases. By 2025, half of the world's population will not have adequate access to water. It could not be more serious. We see what happens in other parts of the world, and, and we just always think that never can be me. It already is you. Why so serious? So I know it's a surprise to some people that there is a crisis, but the reality is in the United States, we Americans are spoiled. We have the biggest water footprint in the world. When there's a water problem, the ripple effect is enormous. Downstream, the water finds its way to you. And it definitely rocks the boat. Oh, shit, my glass is empty. That sucks. People love water especially when it's 118 degrees outside in the summer. We sell virtual reality. People come to Las Vegas to escape their reality. And part of that is the cooling sensation of fountains. It looks like prolific waste. What they don't understand is that the entire Las Vegas Strip uses 3% of this community's water supply and is the single largest contributor to this state's economic product. We see growth every time it snows in Buffalo. And water consumption all of a sudden began skyrocketing. The amazing thing about Vegas is that it refuses to let the lack of water constrain its growth. Las Vegas has built housing developments as large as San Francisco. They never worried about water, because right next door to Vegas is Hoover Dam. And behind Hoover Dam is Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the country. Hoover Dam and its power plant serve water and power needs in California, Nevada, and Arizona. When it was built, Hoover Dam and Lake Mead were going to save the West forever. Colorado River waters that once destroyed man and his property now serve him.
you don't have to be a scientist to understand that if you take more water out of the bathtub than you put into the bathtub, the bathtub will eventually go empty. The elevation has been dropping 10 feet every year. Today, it's only about 40% full. We're measuring 1086. Las Vegas will lose our upper intake at elevation 1050. 1050 will be a wake-up call because at 1050, Hoover Dam stops generating electricity. You've only got 36 feet to go. That's four years. No one ever imagined that that was possible. In my mind, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. In our original work, we looked at the situation where the lakes go dry, actually Deadpool. By 2025, we could have reached that with probability about 50%. We were shocked. When I think of water, I think of it as a giant milkshake glass. And I think of each demand for water as a straw in the glass. But the amount of water being taken out of the Colorado system is maxed out right now, and yet there's going to be less. If we don't do anything, Las Vegas is a dead city, period, full stop. And they are proposing to build a $3 billion pipeline, 250 miles long, to draw water out of one of the last oases in Nevada. This is a project out of sheer desperation because there's nothing else available. If they get the water line in here, it'll just turn into a dust bowl. If you haven't done any water, you're done. They take that, and where do I go? I'm done. And my kids are done. very people you wouldn't hurt if they were your neighbors, you'll fight to the death over a glass of water. This project may succeed over my dead body. Can you afford not to build it? Are you willing to put your family at risk? That's what it gets down to. This pipeline, it's gonna be built, isn't it? There is no option. So am I supposed to sit here and say, the fate of two million people doesn't matter to me. They're just going to have to live with whatever mother nature decides to dole out. That is about as irresponsible a statement as I've ever heard someone Address come up with. The way the city was developed, the way it was planned, politicians just let people build whatever the heck they wanted. If you want to say it should never have happened, well, the cows have left the barn. If Las Vegas is going to keep growing, they'll take this water, and then they'll still run out of water. It's easy to point the finger at Vegas, but when you look at the future of growth and water, we're all Vegas. When we get hit, Phoenix gets hit, and Los Angeles gets hit. The mighty Rio Grande, now nothing more than a dirt road. People in Atlanta are actually praying for rain. Lake Superior is said to be disappearing. 36 U.S. states face water shortages in the next three years. Junior, it's time for you to visit your Mother Earth. Oh, Pop, let me stay here with you. When we think of water, we think of it as the air, infinite and inexhaustible. This is the cycle of water by which all life survives. All the water there ever was still is. We are drinking the same water that the dinosaurs drank. So how can there possibly be a problem with the water supply? Turn a faucet, and there is water at any hour of the day or night. The resource is renewable. 
That's the beauty of the hydrologic cycle. But when you use such quantities that it exceeds the capacity of the system to renew itself, then you have a problem. You know, I used to think that it might be impossible to run out of water. There's a lot of water on the Earth, but less than 1% is fresh water that's available to drink. There are places that could actually run out of water, and California is one of them. When I would drive through the Central Valley, I'd see all these signs about water. That's actually how I got interested in, in studying the valley, was by seeing those signs and trying to understand what was going on. I really had no idea that I was opening such a Pandora's box. For California's valley, a good supply of water all through the year has changed a worthless desert into productive farmland. Back in the 30s, the government turned on the tap for the farmers. The Central Valley produces about 25% of the food consumed in the United States. We now have about 7 million irrigated acres. We're stretching a limited resource to its limits. It really is a giant can of worms. These almonds are being removed because of a lack of water. I had to walk away, yeah. I knew it was coming, but I couldn't take the, couldn't take the hardship to watch, yeah. Certainly, it's heartbreaking. And I was out here putting the trees in the ground 23 years ago, and now we've had the rug pulled out from under us. Some people say this is the first instance of people in the United States turning on the tap and not getting water. West Valley farmers will not get any federal water this season. That decision is a result of less water pumping to protect fish populations in Northern California. The Central Valley of California was once considered the breadbasket of America, but now farms all over that region have been allowed to dry up. Now, why? Because of a two-inch minnow on the endangered species list. Where I come from, we call that baits. Somebody has got to turn the water back on. The Either that or there. put us under the endangered species list. Uh, you're going to get your vegetables from China. And I understand they make great uh, baby milk formula. By the way, be sure to check out Sean Hannity's new children's book, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish. Boo! <laughs> Boo, fish! It's been convenient for certain politicians to say, look, we're hurting people. Why should we protect this little fish at the expense of people? But that's wrong. The delta smelt is a small, insignificant little fish. But it's not insignificant if you realize the delta smelt's just a, a symbol of a much bigger problem. It's a symbol of an ecosystem that's collapsing. The water for the Central Valley comes from the Sierras. It ends up in the Bay Delta. This is the greatest estuary on the West Coast, and we've allowed it to crash. All of the fish, it's not only the salmon, it's not only the delta smelt. It's going to impact everything. It's going to impact the people. The last two seasons, we didn't have any salmon fishing whatsoever. You know, we still sell fish, but we bring in it from someplace else. What, Alaskan king, huh? Yeah. yeah. We could see the absolute demise of salmon here in California. We fishermen have to speak up. We've become politicians and activists. No water for the farmers because of this fish. Yeah, that fish! California, in many ways, is the epitome of the global water problem. We need water. We need water. We love The truth is there's not enough water to do everything everybody wants. 
Farmers use most of the water. That's about 80% in most states. In some western states, it's as high as 90%. So when we want to talk about the future of water, we have to talk about farm use. The people that have taken the water away from us have told us, well, your solution is to turn to groundwater. So I ask them, is it going to be on your watch that we now dry up all the groundwater source in the San Joaquin Valley? Hard decisions, aren't they? The water that gets deep into the ground stores up as a subterranean treasure. Farmers have had their surface water cut way, way back. And so the logical thing to do then is to pump groundwater. All around the United States, the water table in the aquifers is going down. And it took, in many places, thousands of years for this water to accumulate in the aquifers. And yet, we're going through it in mere decades. For many years, I've been working with a satellite called GRACE. If you are looking at an area that's had a big mass change, say from groundwater depletion, Grace can see that because the mass change is so big that it's actually sensed by the satellites. Oh, we can see significant depletion in California. We've been keeping a close eye on the Central Valley. If we go back to 1998, the aquifer has lost about one and a half times the volume of Lake Mead. That's a huge amount of water. How much is left in the aquifer? Let me see how I can sugarcoat this. <laughs> you know, I ran some back of the envelope numbers, looking at how long it would take at those pumping rates for the aquifer to be depleted. And I got a number between, say, 60 and 100 years. So at the low end, 60 years, that's frightening. I think California is in trouble. The combination of climate change, growth, and groundwater depletion spells a train wreck. Well, if you had to pick one place in the United States that is really right in the crosshairs, it's got to be Southern California. What would happen if we suddenly didn't have the water? That's when people will finally say, oh my god, we have a water problem. Build new dams, do this, do that. Too late. We need to start planning for the future, and it's a future in which we're not going to have a huge snowpack in the Sierras or the Rocky Mountains. It's just, it's not going to be there. If you told your parents that by the end of the 21st century, there'd be no snow in California, do you think they'd believe you? It, this, is, this is the future. Okay, this is the, the water They'll see it happen. They'll experience it. And it's a very difficult thing for people to grasp. It's been like watching a, a Polaroid develop, truly. It's like an oh my God moment. You realize, I can't believe this is happening and I, I need to tell somebody about it. California faces a water crisis of potentially epic proportion. You know, how we respond today will define who we are tomorrow. Need additional storage. I mean, they built reservoirs for a reason. Shasta, Hoover. If you owe the bank and the county taxes, you're going to try to farm as much as you can. They're not going to make more water. The only solution to this thing is conservation. I agree we should look into conservation, but that's not going to yield or have any effect on our groundwater shortage. I didn't, want to, I, I didn't want to get into this, but your arguments about conservation and efficiency are just wrong. And if you're right, the conservation and efficiency isn't going to get us anything. And if I'm right, there's not a lot of new supply out there, then what are we left with? Take land out of production. I don't know anyone who, I don't know anyone who wants that. Your arguments just don't make any sense. You have to live in the valley. You have to understand the management of water here. Well, that's bad management. And, and you're one of the managers. I'm sorry. What I'm, what I'm telling you, 1.2 million acres. That whole system and I wanted to make clearly the statement that we do face a crisis now uh, uh, of epic proportions. And, and I said that. Um, and I'm not sure that it really resonated. 
which to me is a little startling. When we talk about water... Uh, we need a plan, and we don't have one. And it is complex. We're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> Australia is much like California in many ways. It has a very large agricultural community that uses most of the water that humans in Australia use. The one thing that Australia has had that California has not had is nearly a decade of incredibly severe drought. What we're seeing is a whole host of bizarre problems that are cropping up. Australians in Sydney woke up this morning to find the skies glowing red. The inland parts are so dry, it picked up uh, vast quantities of topsoil. There is a plague ravaging the Australian outback. Drought is driving the animals into towns. Crews in Australia battling the deadliest wildfires in the country's history right now. The California of tomorrow is the Australia of today. They're having to dramatically and radically rethink agriculture. There was actually nothing that grew. You put the crop in and you had nothing but dust. I was at a guy's house once. This stock was the worst they'd ever seen. In my opinion, some of these cattle might have to be put down. What, how would you cope with that? He said he'll kill himself. He told me straight out, I'll kill myself. I go to farms in, in the couple of shires and ask them how they're going. Mm. Got over here where we're going today. They haven't had any water allocation for five years. So we've had to buy in a lot of feed because uh, we can't grow it ourselves with no water. So the milk price doesn't cover the cost of production. You must have had enormous stress on your families and yourself going through all these issues with no water and... That's an understatement. No, that would be an understatement. Yeah, that's an understatement. It's our cows. They're my babies. There is no future here because of the control of the water. They are taking it away from the farmers. When you go to two or three houses and you hear the same story about stress, anxiety, debt... I would never know what I was coming home to. You had a fear of that? Yeah, absolutely. Be wondering, like, yeah. the whole time. I better just um, make sure he was still alive and that sort of thing. Yeah. In the area that I work, there's been eight people that have taken their own lives. One was fairly recent, where I'd done all the referrals that I could, and he had his medication. Uh, there's nothing that I know or that anybody that I work with could have put in place more than what it was. And... Um, he, he um, took his own life that last September. And the way that I cope with that is through my family and my horses. All day I face the barren waste without the taste of water. Cool, clear water. Here's the burning question. Do you believe what's going on in the last few years is climate change? Oh, look, I think the climate's constantly changed. I don't think there's been any short-term thing that's made a difference. Personal opinion, climates change all the time, don't they, Ivan? We're hoping it's a severely dry cycle in Australia, not climate change, because if it is climate change, um, this part of Australia is in deep shit. <laughs> in the scientific community, we're starting to think it's not drought, it's really part of climate change. Australia is way past what many people consider to be the, the carrying capacity in terms of how much water there is. They're way, way past it. We're having an auction which we're selling around about 170 head of our cows. They're starting to wind the farm down. We've seen good friends go through the same issue, so we know what... got a bit of an inkling of what we're headed for. What would be the hardest thing for you two to see today? Uh, 
Yeah, I suppose a farm with no black and white cows on it. <laughs> anyway. Boys, you're all gone. It's mine direct, and I'll be 2,800 of the money done. I'll be 2,000 to buy. I got 15 a bit now. 15, I've got to be 15 bit of the world, and then I'll be 15. I got 16 bit now. 17, got to be 17 bit now. Done. I got 1,000, 2,000 dollars now. 200, 300, 300. You're gone in front, and I got 2,800 of the money, and the bids on my right. I got 3,000. Is not a year, and if you're guessing about, I got 3,000 bid once. I'll be 3,000 twice. Third and final bid at 3,000 dollars, and I sell. Done. Order. <laughs> Buyer one will be very happy with her. What a wonderful gal. Oh, and 55's a Modesto, and she's out of the same family car. Now, this cow is part of the 25th of April. All day I faced a barren waste without the taste of water. Cool water. Old Dan and I, with throats burnt dry and souls that cry. Oh, water, cool, clear water. The whole nature of the water cycle is changing, driven by changing climate. In our new study, we found that the water cycle is intensifying. That truly means a much more stormy future in many parts of the world. And in other regions, we'll have more extreme droughts. These are first of their kind observations. There have been many studies that suggested that this may be happening in the future, and our research has shown that it's actually happening right now. Will the water cycle spin out of control? It's hard in the United States to fathom the scope of the potential change, and the, and the scope is huge. These current findings, is this going to get people's attention? I don't think so. We think that we have this right to use as much water as we can get our hands on. There aren't many things that my neighbors do <laughs> that drive me crazy. And uh, one of the, the biggest is, is overwatering the yard. In the arid and semi-arid regions, watering the lawn may account for 50 to 75% of household water use. We're talking about three times the volume of Lake Mead just to water the grass every year. The biggest mistake in thinking about water has always been thinking about it as disconnected from everything else. There are hidden costs of water in almost every product we use. Households, the single largest user of water is the toilet. Uh, this is a high efficiency toilet. It uses 1.2 gallons every time you flush it. There, I've just wasted 1.2 gallons. The toilets in many people's homes still use six gallons. That's six billion gallons a day that we use merely to flush away human waste. The plant itself is an amazing process where we, you can actually take dirty, filthy, disgusting water and make it clean so it's fishable and swimmable in the area around New York. Understanding wastewater is just one step in understanding everything about your environment. All this is like pretty Egyptian technology. 
This is just the wheel moving up and down with a simple rake, embedding the tines in between the spaces and clearing the debris away. The debris that comes in is the debris that comes from our toilets, our sinks, our bathrooms, and also from the street. As emerging things change, they wind up in the waste stream, and we see it here. Up until maybe eight years ago or so, we very rarely saw a bottled water. It's very prevalent now. The spirit of the times. I'm about to open up one of the four doors that allow you to see what goes on here. You can see the condoms floating on the top of the surface. It is what it is. If 100 pounds of waste product comes in with all that water, I have to remove 85 pounds of it, and the 15 pounds remaining is legally allowed to go into the receiving water. The treatment of sewage, it's a very simple biological process in which we're just speeding up nature. There's a lot of talk nowadays about chemicals coming into the systems and antibiotics that are coming into the systems, and those things were not never meant to be treated in a domestic wastewater treatment plant. Right now, they cannot possibly deal with the myriad of chemicals that are out there. The traditional pollution scenario was a large industrial pipe sticking out of the side of a factory spewing brown gunk into the pristine waters and seeing the fish and the ducks die. Then there were a few astonishing examples of water pollution. The Cuyahoga River in Ohio burst into flames in 1969. It was just so bizarre. How can water catch fire? This case made national headlines and galvanized the environmental movement. start pollution, people can stop it. The net result of that was the foundation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the signing of the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act in the early 70s. It was originally a very strong law, but times have changed. Pollution in America is increasing rather than decreasing. In the five years between 2004 and 2009, the Clean Water Act was violated a half a million times. The old pollution was a river on fire. The new pollution is something you can't even see. Whether it's birth control pills, erectile dysfunction medicines, hormone supplements, our bodies absorb some of them, we excrete the rest of the chemicals, we flush them away, they go to the treatment plant, and they are not removed. Consider vast Lake Mead. Tests have found trace levels of birth control, steroids, narcotics, and more. The U.S. is the leading producer of these new contaminants. We don't know how harmful these chemicals are, and there are more added all the time. The EPA approves one to 2,000 chemicals a year. The more difficult and dangerous ones are industrial contaminants. These are the chemicals that were the subject of Aaron Brockovich. Counselors. The scene where, you know, it's so funny to say Ed Masry and I, but Albert Finney and Julia <laughs> were on one side of the table and PG&E's defense attorneys were on the other. And Julia oh, says, by the way, we had that water brought in special for you folks. Came from Llewellyn Hinckley. <laughs> <clears throat> Why would you pick up and knowingly drink a glass of contaminated water? You wouldn't. I, I just think that said so much. That was my wake-up call in Hinkley. I would see the absence of wildlife. I would listen to these people's accounts of what was happening to their health. And I thought, what is happening here? What's the common denominator that is affecting all of this? And I was like, ugh, water. I remember way back when I began my work out there in 1991 that it was an isolated incident. And it is far from anything isolated. For 20 years, I'm down on the ground. And we've got these communities, maybe they've noted too many children with cancer, the animals that are dying with tumors, and we don't know what it is. 
you ask for there people here in this room that may have cancer or uh, leukemias. Can I see a show of hands? Oh my, can you keep your hands up? People start looking around the room and they're like, you have cancer? Well, I didn't know you have that cancer. Your child has that cancer? Well, my child has that cancer. So that is what's starting to really rattle me. A developing story out of Midland this evening. High-profile environmental activist Aaron Brockovich is in town tonight with a toxic, contaminated water problem. Concerned residents called in Brockovich, who is a consultant for two environmental law firms, to investigate. A year ago, one of the community members came to me. Her granddaughter was having these very strange skin rashes and sent me a picture of a swimming pool that was green. Is your water still running? Oh, green? yeah. Definitely greener. And I'm just immediately, I'm like, uh oh, I have a feeling I know what this is. Hexvalent chromium. You know what I worry about the grandbabies? And stuff? The reason I had to contact her is because we went to our local government. I bet I wrote over a thousand letters to all of our congressmen and our legislature, everybody. They've just failed us. She's a lot older. <laughs> so, you know. I emailed Erin Brockovich, and she emailed me back in 30 minutes. I hadn't even seen the movie Aaron Brockovich. I had never seen it until after I met Aaron. <laughs> then I watched the movie. Hexavalent chromium. Oh, well, it's poisonous. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The biggest scene was when she's talking to the lady and she looks out there and her kids are playing in the pool. Ashley! Stand up! You're at the pool! That's how I felt when I realized that I had been putting my grandkids in toxic water in that swimming pool. It was very, very emotional for me. My grandkids all said, the pool hurts us. And I didn't even put it together. Here, here's Janet Nall now. And, uh, they were very high numbers of hexavalent chromium, higher than anything I'd ever seen in Hinkley. You can't go on city water? Well, they, they're telling us there's no water for us. No water for you. So and you can drink to drink poison. Quote, not my problem. Mm. This is part of the 40 million Americans that are still on their own well water. 40 million? Yeah, people just fall off the grid. One of the big loopholes in American water law is for so-called domestic wells. Many of these are never tested for chemicals. The state acted pretty quickly. They got filtration systems on there. But then that's kind of where it ends. Honestly, when I got the letter from the state, I really thought, you know, it said it was, my water was safe for drinking. So we haven't really stopped. I mean, we bathe, we take showers. We, I mean, we have to. That's where we live. Our test showed dangerously high levels of hexavalent chromium. That poor guy could have gone years. It could have been years that he'd consumed this water. The chemical concentration of chromium-6 here in Midland is the, the, the largest I've ever seen anywhere. The concentrations are just extreme. My house is right here where it's 319. Right now, we're at 818. But right here, where Angie died, it was 1100 last year. Angie lives right next door to Ground Zero. She passed away three weeks ago from um, lupus which I've got the forerunner to lupus now. Are you feeling OK? That's my, f my fear, is not living long enough to take care of everybody out here, especially my grandkids. So what, their last resort is some litigation? How long is that going to take, 15, 20 years? You know, I just get so aggravated because they're not listening, they're not caring. And they're not even trying to find who did it. Now, what's Recently. this out here that you've got? This is in? the pits. We believe all the oil field companies dumped in that pit. Through our investigative work, we actually believe it's a company, Schlumberger, just up the road here. This particular Schlumberger facility is the mothership. Schlumberger's official statement is that they never used hexavalent chromium. The EPA's initial report never identified the source through further investigation, we will get to the bottom of it. What makes it so frustrating is that you can't find out what any of the chemicals are that are being deployed out into the environment.
under something referred to as the Halliburton loophole. The Halliburton loophole was pushed through by then Vice President Cheney. Cheney exempted all of the oil and gas fracking companies from the Safe Drinking Water Act. It was, it's insanity. It's good to be here in Texas. Midland, Texas is one of uh, North America's most aggressive in oil and gas field development. And it is the childhood home of George Bush. People don't usually poison their own neighborhoods. What's the old saying? You, shit, you don't shit where you eat. <laughs> they're saying it goes, they're saying it kind of goes like that. We live about a block and a half west of the contaminated area. Are we really safe? What can we do to protect ourselves now? Are we still going to be declared a Superfund, in your opinion? They can come in and issue you a Superfund status, but that ain't going to stop anything. This agency's broke. Didn't have any money? Oh, oh EPA's broke. They got nothing. 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 They have 1,200 Superfund sites now they can't do anything with. I'm telling you, Superman is not coming. People still believe that that arm of government is going to come save us. And the look on their face even kind of startled me. I wish that I could come here tonight and tell you it's going to be OK. But that's not what's going to happen. And I don't want to lie to you. We moved here from Mesa. I've done hair there for years, and I do hair here. I have more clients here with cancer. I've shaved more heads here in three years than I ever did there. And I'm just concerned about our own children are waking up with nosebleeds. I don't think I need to tell you, nor do I want to scare you, how carcinogenic hexavalent chromium is. You know, when we first saw the numbers, I have to tell you, some people I work with, we looked at each other and we just, it was, they're walking dead. And at that point for me, it gets really hard to be a cheerleader and always try to find some hope in it for them. If you stay together and you use your voice and you push back, you will make some progress. At least you know the truth. We the community, we want water. That's all we want is good, potable water. Something when we turn on the faucet and we know it's okay to brush our teeth with it. Some of these chemicals can take up to 100 years to get rid of, and what are we supposed to do in the interim? I mean, there's this vast world underneath our feet that we don't see. Out of sight, out of mind, we don't see it, we don't know where it goes, and therefore, we don't pay attention. I mean, I've been fascinated by amphibians for as long as I can remember. So as a child, I was fascinated by metamorphoses, watching tadpoles turn into frogs. Then I ended up at Harvard, where I majored in biology. And I ended up in a laboratory there where I focused on amphibian development. My work was getting fairly well known. Fork in the road. Can we take it? <laughs> Twelve years ago, I'd never heard of atrazine. Atrazine is an herbicide or weed killer. Until a few years ago, it was the number one selling agricultural pesticide in the world. I was approached by the manufacturer to examine whether or not atrazine was an endocrine disruptor in amphibians. The term endocrine disruptor refers to anything that would interfere with the hormone's action. And we found that the atrazine-exposed animals weren't making testosterone properly. In some cases, the atrazine makes them make enough estrogen that they actually turn into females. 
these are two genetic males that were exposed to atrazine that actually developed into females. So as you can see, the males are smaller, but, but now genetically, right, these are, these are all males. The guy on top is a male, and that's his brother that he's on top of. It's a hard thing to describe. <laughs> What does this have to do with people? Why do we care? Frogs and fish, which live in the contaminated water, they're much more sensitive as they're going through these developmental stages. On the other hand, a human fetus is inside an amniotic sac filled with water. That's going through critical developmental stages where hormones are important. The same estrogen, for example, that makes my frogs turn into hermaphrodites, that same estrogen is important in breast cancer. When people think of science, you know, they, they think of CSI. In field work, you really have to sort through all these potential suspects. I think there's a line from one of the guys in CSI. How do you find the answer? Follow the evidence, even if we don't like where it takes us. And, and that's really what we're doing is, in this case, following the atrazine. Atrazine is the most common pesticide contaminant of drinking water, groundwater. There's a couple studies came out showing that atrazine is associated with breast cancer and birth defects in humans. There's a factory where Syngenta produces atrazine. The prostate cancer in their workers is 8.4 times higher. The U.S. Geological Survey says they can detect it in the rainwater in Minnesota from when they're applying it in Kansas. I'm the principal scientist here at Syngenta Crop Protection. Uh, on the occasions where atrazine is found in water, it's extremely low, in the part per billion range. Starting at 0.1 parts per billion, we started getting these hermaphrodites. And, and, that's, and that's an incredible number, 0.1 parts per billion. The drinking water standard for atrazine is three parts per billion. That's 30 times higher than we know is biologically harmful in amphibians and in fish. That's an average over the year, so at the season when it's applied, it's going to be much higher than that. And those data are now coming to light, especially in the Midwest, where most of the atrazine is used. Several Southern Illinois water districts have joined a lawsuit against an herbicide maker. They claim the chemical atrazine is contaminating their water supply. Water utilities in Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, Kansas, and Iowa are suing Syngenta to recover the cost of filtering out atrazine. The company that makes atrazine, they're based out of Switzerland. That's a funny thing, because atrazine is effectively banned in Europe. In Europe, they utilize something called the precautionary principle, which says that if there's any data to suggest that something's harmful, the manufacturer has to prove that it's safe or it's off the market. So you're guilty until proven innocent. In the US, it's the opposite. You're innocent until proven guilty. So the company's charged with proving that their compound's bad, otherwise it stays on the market. These companies, they're really the only ones with the money to pay for all the scientific studies that cost millions and millions of dollars to do. More often than not, industry are self-regulating. The goal here is to keep your product on the market as long as possible. So if you don't look for a problem, you won't find a problem, and you can continue selling your product. There's been some cases where test results are thrown away, set aside. And I had lots of friends who would say, well, I'll be careful. And I said, well, what do I have to be careful about? And I was a bit surprised when the company, their response was, well, let's make it go away. And then I sort of thought, you know, this is not the kind of person that I want to be, that this is not the um, sense of social responsibility that, that my parents, you know, had, had, had taught me. It was Albert Einstein who said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. I have actively advocated for banning atrazine. Then has two more ovaries. It's not normal. <laughs> There's multiple sites where you can sign petitions to stop the use of atrazine. The pesticide industry, it's us versus them. What you do is, who's ever attacking you, you try and destroy their credibility. They followed me around to meetings. They disrupt lectures that I'm giving. They once filed a false claim that I was harassing endangered species with my research, and I had armed guys come and take me out of my classroom to arrest me. Atrazine is used on corn, 
And corn is our number one product. You're not gonna mess with corn. It's about corn, it's about the ethanol lobby. It's the big guys. The first EPA hearing, I was the only academic there presenting data for atrazine that wasn't paid by Syngenta. You know, one of the biggest disillusionments I've had in this whole thing is with the EPA. Based on the Toxic Substances Control Act, since 1976, EPA has issued regulations to control only five existing chemicals determined to present an unreasonable risk. That is five out of almost 80,000 existing chemicals. A 2005 study found 287 different chemicals in the cord blood of 10 newborn babies. Our kids are getting steady infusions of industrial chemicals before we even give them solid food. I have one simple message, and that is that EPA is back on the job for the American people to protect them. We got a new head of EPA, and one of the first things they announced was, we're gonna reopen up this atrazine thing. The EPA examined well over 6,000 studies and they re-registered atrazine in 2006. So we really don't think this is necessary. Atrazine is the poster child for what needs to be done to reorganize how the EPA evaluates the safety of chemicals. I've recently been joined by 39 scientists from 12 countries. The data is stacking up. And, and I would suggest that it's time for action. You're talking about a two and a half billion dollar hit to growers and who ultimately pays the price for higher costs that growers have? There are times when I just think, geez, I'm tired. It's going to be interesting to see how the EPA responds to this last set of reviews. I'm hopeful and I would like to be optimistic, um, but it, it's a tough call. This new EPA? <laughs> is, there <a> new <laughs> is there a new EPA? I don't see a new agency. I wish them luck, because they've got a hell of a task in front of them. They're understaffed, they're overburdened, and they're broke. There's many highly qualified, awesome human beings within these agencies that want to do the right things, but their hands are tied. If EPA has adequate data and wants to protect the public against known risk, the law creates obstacles to quick and effective action. We have to stop looking to them for the answers because I don't know that they have them. Hinkley, California. After the worldwide attention that came with a Hollywood film, people who live here thought their problems would have ended a long time ago. It turns out those toxic chemicals have been spreading over time. I feel like Groundhog's Day. This huge, giant utility company, you're still not telling the truth, and you're still poisoning people. What do you want me to say? They're pathetic. You set a standard, there's no one around to enforce it. You can just get away with murder. We've got to shake ourselves out of this false sense of security. And we're all gonna have to roll our sleeves up. I'm family farmer, grandmother, mother, wife, um, water sentinel for the Michigan Sierra Club. Most people have the bucolic vision of a small rural farm. When the CAFOs came in, we've seen a deterioration of the communities. CAFO stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding operation. It's generally defined as a large industrial farm that has 700 or more cows. So much manure is produced that the only way for them to get rid of it is to store it in giant lagoons and to spread it on fields in a liquid form. Within a 10 mile radius here we have over 60 lagoons that hold over 400 million gallons of waste. Get your 
plate? What do you want? <laughs> We're really concerned about health issues with as young as uh, our granddaughter is. My granddaughter could never play in the cricks and the streams because of what was happening. I'm just a country girl, and I taught myself to do water sampling. You have your antibiotics that they give to the animals, growth hormones, chemicals, and now you've got a toxic waste that they're spreading untreated on the land. We have some bad stuff yeah, here. Yeah, we sure do. I have lots of names, the white-haired witch, the pooparazzi, shit-huggers, um, a lot of I can't say. <laughs> the tractor light blinking? Yeah. Here they come. They're hauling to the illegal lagoon. He's dumping right now. Look at him shoot it out. In Michigan, a lot of the problems that we've had uh, deals with the, the CAFOs that have dairy cows at them. And the reason for that is just simply the amount of waste that the cow generates. 150 pounds of manure every day. One cow would equal 23 humans for the same amount of waste. So when you're talking about a dairy that has five or 6,000 cows on it, you're really talking the amount of waste being produced in a day that a fairly large sized city would be producing. You know, it reminds you of the Jim Carrey movie, what you want to say, stop breaking the law, asshole. She's someone that, you know, everyone in our department knows quite well. <laughs> and she's often the first one out there with a camera. We just can't be out here every day. We don't have the resources to do it. Okay, so the first one we're passing is Griba 1. I've never seen them that full. Unbelievable. You can see where the dead trees are in the corner. We got overflow into the corner. The lagoon is leaking. Her work has come directly to the table. Based on what we've gotten, we have reason to deny this permit now. The emissions coming off, it's putrid. I have lost a third of my lung capacity from my work. And once the damage has occurred, there isn't anything that's going to restore you to a normal state of health. So I think avoidance is the key. OK. The illnesses associated with the bacteria from CAFOs can be deadly. E. coli 0157, there is no medical treatment for that. We've seen readings as high as seven and a half million E. coli. When people think, well, it's just one stream, you know, it's not that big of a deal. All of the waterways in Michigan are connected in one way or another, through surface waters or through groundwater. It's really all one big lake, in a sense. Well, it's a different kind of trouble for the waters of Lake Erie right now, algae. Some blooms may be in the city's drinking water. The EPA is warning people to limit their contact with the water, but those warnings didn't seem to worry many people at the beach today. It's only a matter of time before we have a catastrophe because of all of the runoff that is going into our waterways. A lot of people have gotten so frustrated. They've moved, they've sold, they've given up. Once they had seen me out monitoring, I started getting harassment and intimidation. Dead animals left in my mailbox, on my front porch, in my car. The most recent was my two-year-old granddaughter's bedroom window was shot out. She was sleeping in her bed when it happened. If you're going to be cowardly enough to hurt a child, then we really need to look at this issue much harder, because people are at risk. Watch your step. We try and get on site and off the site within two minutes. 
You're MacGyver. Here. <laughs> the MacGyver of water testing. We're just middle-aged women that, you know, sensible shoes are not the answer no more. It's not bad. It's pretty warm. It isn't too bad, is it? Mm-mm. Oh. <laughs> oh, the water's cold. It's warm. Yeah. It's not one lake that's contaminated. It's 30. It's 300. It's 3,000. Every single state has emailed me with some sort of problem. Twenty-five thousand inquiries in a month, to the point where I've actually started to create a map. And what's scaring us is we still have seven hundred more entries to input, so we're able to start connecting those dots to get some kind of. There's just so many accounts of contamination. You got a fish kill here on the Noose River. We've lost over a billion fish. They were burying them on the beach with bulldozers. We would take a glass of water out of the tap. It would smell like diesel fuel. Oh. My life is over without my water. Six of our neighbors within a 10 house span had brain tumors and half of them died. It was like, oh my gosh, it's in the water. We've got to get the kids out of here. You know, we've got to do something. So all of a sudden, it's like, I can't just talk to you about Hinkley because, oh, it makes me think of what's going on in Arizona, in Alabama, in Washington, in Texas, because it's happening everywhere. So I just feel like this is my contribution to taking the information and doing something with it in hopes that I can get it somewhere or a message out and do something about it. You read it too many times and then you just start getting antsy. Okay. I am antsy. You'll be fine. So what do you think after all these years yeah, and you're six... You're make some comment about me being 50 again? Yeah, there you go. You are an old hag. <laughs> You've been hanging around Hinkley too much. <laughs> I think Chrome 6 causes wrinkles. I am such an ass. <laughs> you know what, Bob? I could still kick your ass. Absolutely. These communities are sending out an SOS. Yet the system for investigating, responding, and reporting these concerns is inadequate. Could I, could I, could somebody hold up that map? It's unbelievable to me that they would call you rather than call the EPA or the NIH. These people have said, we just don't know where else to go. It's a daunting process. But just burying your head in the sand isn't going to work anymore. And for everybody else who's not out there, Mr. Policymaker, you better come out here and take a look at what's really going on. So don't get lost in your bubble. Don't get stuck up there in your ivory tower and think that the world out here doesn't exist around you. Because it does. And it's happening. So see, now you piss me off. <laughs> Everywhere I go, it's a huge question. What am I supposed to drink? We can't survive on Diet Coke. When I'm in New York, I typically drink bottled water. I try to buy bottled water because it just tastes cleaner. I have some friends who only drink bottled water. They keep it in their fridge. They would never touch tap water. They think it's disgusting. When I was growing up in New York City, we never drank bottled water. There was no bottled water. Today, the United States is the largest consumer of bottled water in the world. We're just increasingly fearful of what comes out of our tap. That's a problem, but the solution's not to drink bottled water. I'd say bottled water is probably regulated more frequently just because they have to sell it, and so obviously it has to go through a ton of tests. Bottled water is regulated not by the US EPA, which regulates our tap water, but it's regulated as a food product by the Food and Drug Administration. 
The testing is done by the bottled water companies themselves. It's not as frequent. I had to file some Freedom of Information Act requests. And it turns out there have been more than 100 cases of bottled water recalls that we know about for things like coliform bacteria, sanitizer, mold, glass particles, crickets, or cricket parts. There's been just an incredible marketing campaign that convinces us that buying bottled water is a smart and rational thing to do rather than an act of irrationality. You buy Arctic spring water, and it turns out it doesn't come from anywhere near the Arctic. 45% of the water sold in the US originates as tap water. We built an incredible tap water system in this country, and yet we've forgotten what it used to be like. In New York City, tens of thousands of people would die in wave after wave of cholera. We got rid of water-related diseases when the US built a high-quality municipal water system. If we were to abandon that system, what's the rest of the world going to do? They're going to think, all right, well, we'll just make bottled water, too. And the poorest people are going to end up drinking contaminated water. There's water in the new stadium and concession stand coolers stacked against the wall. But on the walls outside the restrooms, none. Under 2001 code, bottled water can take the place of drinking fountains. That's what UCF will do on Saturday. Their first game was a hot day. They ran out of bottled water halfway through the game. A dozen and a half taken to the hospital. UCF's new football stadium ran out of drinking water. It's a way to convert a public resource into a private good and a commodity. The answer has got to be high quality, safe water for everyone. There are a billion people without access to safe drinking water. One of the most poignant images is the woman lugging very heavy bottles of water back to their homes, while here in the United States, we have suburban shoppers lugging cases of water back to a home that has perfectly potable water in it. There are a lot of old decaying pipes out there. We need to upgrade the entire infrastructure and get rid of the new contaminants that we're finding. And in the end, what we spend would be far less than what we would spend to buy bottled water. The question is, how can we regain public trust in our water system? This is a brand new bottle of water. I'm going to open the seal, and I'm going to pour it into this glass. Now, can I have our next course? Now, what we have here is uh, two cockroaches. I'm going to take one of them, and I'm going to put it in the water and take it out, just like that. Flick, flick. Now, how about a sip of this water? You don't want it. Nobody will drink this water. They say, it's a cockroach. You cockroached the water. Somehow, cockroachness has entered into the water. And that's the point. That's contagion. I study disgust. There's a veneer of fear. Fear is an easy account for why you're disgusted. But often, it's not that. It's much deeper. And this is a plastic cockroach. Now, how would you like to drink this water? You don't want this either. This isn't a real cockroach. It's just a piece of rubber. Disgust is never really rational. The problem is a mental problem, and the same thing can be applied to recycled water. The simplest way to get water is to take the water you've just used and make it into usable water again. That's recycled water. Recycled water is generally thought to be the solution to water shortage. It's safe, it's efficient, it's ecologically sound, it makes total sense, but it's offensive. Now, Singapore has handled this problem rather well. We are just a, a little island, but very densely populated. In Singapore, no raw sewage or used water goes out uh, into the sea. So we recycle it, producing a product that we call new water. We don't even use the term sewage. We just tell them, you know, it's used water. The concern, of course, 
was how would people respond. Uh, and so we explained the technology behind New Water with reverse osmosis. What you get is practically distilled water. In solving our water problems, I think we have turned what has been a, a vulnerability, if you like, uh, into a strength for Singapore. 30% of Singapore's water supply will come from new water. Ironically, recycled water can be the cleanest water out there. Every highly stressed city ought to be considering using recycled water. How about a cold glass of recycled sewer water? Sounds pretty disgusting, doesn't it? Other California cities are also looking into the idea, though they are wary of the public reacting, yuck. We got involved. We talked to the people who run the recycled water facilities. The problem wasn't making the water pure. It is pure. The problem was convincing people to drink it. At a stormy public hearing, many citizens blasted the plan. Don't ever let this happen to the public. Cities have struggled to introduce recycled water. They couldn't get past the yuck factor. The principle of contagion is there's once in contact, always in contact. In the case of recycled water, the image of its origin is just too clear. We live by necessity in a contaminated world. We face disgust and contamination all the time. We just get through life, like with a lot of things, by basically not thinking about it. All water comes from sewage, but the point is you don't think about it when you turn your tap. You can see uh, Nicole is demonstrating uh, on the inside is the uh, urine funnel that's used in the uh, station over there. Astronauts recycle water. They're drinking the processed urine of not just themselves, but other people. It's a potential universe of disgust. So of course, that's something that every uh, shuttle crew member wants to uh, see if it's really as good as they say it is. Probably by the end of a, of a week of a mission, they're not even thinking about it. Here's a toast to everybody uh, drinking the uh, recycled urine. There's a general principle in psychology called mere exposure. If you're exposed to something that's not negative, you tend to get to like it. So part of the problem is getting recycled water into people. Bottled water has a positive image, safety and purity. Ironically, people might be willing to pay for recycled water, but not to drink it from the tap. What a crazy idea that is, but it might be true. The guys who sold bottled water to Americans should be working on selling recycled water to Americans. So, Paul, we've been tasked with creating a marketing campaign to help introduce the idea of reclaimed water to people. How do we sort of overcome the physical rejection that people might have over trying to drink something like this? The thing we use when we do this research is we use Hitler's sweater. Would you be willing to wear Hitler's sweater, okay? And for most people, even after you clean it and wash it and change the color and do anything you want, they still don't want to wear it. The only way we can possibly get people to wear Hitler's sweater is to actually put it on Mother Teresa or Michael Jordan or whoever your hero is so that their spirit enters and conquers Hitler's spirit. So if someone finds something disgusting, it is possible for them to, to, to change their mind on something like that? Yes, we all do that. People go into public toilets and they survive. <laughs> you know, everyone's managing. By the way, there's a new book just written on this by Peter Gleick, G-L-E-I-C-K. Morning. 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 Good morning. I'm Peter Gleick. There's so much money to be made in bottled water, money that municipal agencies don't have for advertising. It's not a fair fight. Uh, this one is uh, I Am Lucky. Eternally pure, no nasty side effects like stinky breath or rotten teeth. I always worry about that with water. How hard is this particular challenge? The idea of raw sewage going in and then turning a tap and literally being able to drink it, convincing consumers of, of that, I think is almost impossible. So I can kick this off with one of my favorite names on the wall, and it has to be Porcelain Springs. And porcelain has certain connotations, you know, white, you know, clean. As an attempt to talk very directly about 
getting over disgust, there is get over it. Because it just looks like something you'd find at Ikea. <laughs> it really does, though. It, I mean, that's, if I were where's the, Ikea, where's the umlaut? We got 80 more names. <laughs> there better be a winner in there somewhere. So we go with Source Derriere. That's the, so that's what we're going with. So when we last met, we narrowed it down to six names that we thought were successful. Started with Porcelain Springs. Water from the most peaceful place on Earth. <laughs> this bottle contains purified sewage water, and you get it. Future water. So the choice you have to make is to drink the solution or ignore the problem. Celebrity endorsement, or you can try to get someone who has already got a reputation that's relevant to us, like Al, let's say Al Gore. On the other hand, it might be Newt Gingrich, who doesn't have that reputation. A, a person who is universally respected could help. Hello? Hello. Is this the right place? Hey, hey sorry I'm late. Don't worry about Let's it. Let's see the fucking world, right? <laughs> Jack, we're so excited you've agreed to be the face of Porcelain Springs. I can't wait to taste this stuff. Just, I was like, Jack's going to love this. They are literally straining the poop juice right out of the water that you and I drink. OK, quiet out here <laughs> whenever you want to, Jack. Yeah, it's just a mental thing. Good. This is someone I think I'd like to trust. He's my man. I, I would be drinking whatever he's drinking. So Porcelain Springs. It's water from the most peaceful place on Earth. The river. Where is the Porcelain Springs? Jed over it. It's French. Get over. Avoir. Avoir. Get over it. Get over it. OK, got it. Porcelain. Oh, porcelain Springs. We're idiots. This bottle contains purified sewage water. Sewage water? Yuck. Awesome. This is a little scary to me. We're recycling water. I mean, all sounds great. That's good. The sewage water. <laughs> oh, really? Can I taste it? Will you drink it? Yeah. Come no. Oh, yeah. I'd do anything once. Because I'm curious. This better be OK. The more you see that something is widely done, the more acceptable it becomes. It's good. Tastes great. Tastes like tap water. Cleaner than tap water. Purified sewage water is actually really good. I might get over it. Even though the majority of people might accept it, some people might not. No chance that I'm going to drink sewage water whatsoever. Disgusting. I want to pour it out right here, maybe on you. If we need to recycle sewage water, that must mean we're in some sort of shortage that I'm not aware of. To be completely honest, the whole issue just doesn't seem like one that's that important to me right now. When they do that m map of uh, from outer space, there's a lot of water. People think that the problem is merely drought, and that once the drought is over, we can go back to business as usual. It's the hydro-illogical cycle. We humans have an infinite capacity to deny reality, to think that there's some oasis out there, somewhere, that we can go to get more water. Tow an iceberg from the Arctic, or divert a river from British Columbia. NASA said today a significant source of water was found when it deliberately crashed a rocket into the lunar surface last month. We could get moon water, just think about that. I mean, nobody's touched this stuff. Moon water would be mwah. I'm sure they can treat the ocean water. The uh, desaltation of the ocean. Of all the things that people ask me about, the most common thing is desalination. Two thirds of the earth is covered by water, and it seems like that's the obvious solution. Desalination is the most expensive source of water we have. That leaves behind it a concentrated brine. It's not quite like spent nuclear fuel, but it's close. Because it's so energy intensive, it produces huge quantities of greenhouse gases. There are more than 14,000 desalination plants around the world. The idea that desalination is going to solve all of our problems is a myth. 
There's no reason to build desalination if you haven't done the conservation and efficiency that's cheaper. Let's wash our clothes with efficient fixtures. Let's think about how to do what we want as efficiently as possible. There is enormous potential to do much more, especially in agriculture. We could grow as much food as we're growing now with a lot less water. Conservation is important, but is this crisis something we can conserve our way out of? Well, that's a deep, th so that's a deep thought question. Uh, so let me give it 10 seconds of deep thought, because I've thought about it, I've thought about it myself, and uh, you know, I, I think the answer is no. We have to couple the water picture that we see now with population growth when there's more people and there's no more water coming from the Sierras and the Colorado River Basin, what exactly are we going to do? Right now, we're hovering under 7 billion people. And there's about 211,000 more people added every day. That's the size of the city where I'm from, Irvine, California. Imagine a new Irvine popping up on the map every day. Project that out 10 years, 20 years. Where is that water going to come from? And it's not just the Sierras that are losing snowpack. It's the Rocky Mountains, it's the Alps, it's the Himalayas. What will happen to the 2 billion people that live in that region when their water source disappears? An infinitely growing population cannot be satisfied with a finite amount of water on this planet. I do worry that we're going to see more and more conflict over water. One person has been killed in the pitched battle over water in Mumbai. The government here has recorded 5,000 water conflicts in this one province. 50 are serious enough to end in violence. In Brazil, tension turned to violence to protest a multi-billion dollar dam. These water tensions could lead to a water war in the Middle East, a doomsday scenario. When I first got involved academically in water resources, people were generally talking about water wars. There's no question that water causes potential disputes all over the world. Islamabad blames New Delhi of stealing its water, leading many to foresee a fourth war between two countries. When we say there's going to be war, now I want to know what the evidence is. And then, but I was going to show and we did a study where we actually looked at all of the documented disputes over 50 years. There are actually 1,800 of those two-thirds are cooperative. Very little actual violence and no wars in the last 50 years. I was absolutely surprised. I was kind of seduced by the water wars argument. It was, it was very exciting. I mean, he, oh, wow, I'm involved in an issue that leads people to war. Well, uh, no, but I'm involved in an issue that brings people in the room to talk about peace. Everywhere, at all scales, water's brought people you wouldn't think to, would be in the same room, into the same room to think about their shared futures. When we look around the United States when we see competition between ranchers and endangered fish. We need to be looking to our uh, friends around the world for how they've coped with crises that are orders of magnitude worse than ours. Even during war, Water committees used to meet. Throughout the Intifada? OK. Yes. Then throughout the Intifada and even between the Jordanians and the, and Israelis, the Israelis before. Before so the peace it's, treaty. It's, it's not that, you know, uh, if there is a conflict, there must be war over water. But you will see it the other way around. People meeting secretly to really solve their differences. Friends of the Earth Middle East is the only regional organization very sadly, that exists. There is no other organization that brings together Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians as one organization in any field. You will always have problems when you are living in a castle and your neighbor is in a cottage. When the Israelis enjoy 
waters 24 7 in jordan it's one day per week and in palestine they'll be lucky if they get it one day per week المساحه اللي كانت موجوده عندك والله انا كنت ازرع من 150 ل 200 دونم نعم ازرع بس وقت الحالي يعني ما اقدر ازرع 10 دونمات في الشميه طيب هلا في عندك بعض الناس فنيين او خبراء مثلا من الاردن ومن اسرائيل اللي بيحاولوا يشتغلوا على قضيه المي او شو رايك؟ فيش حدا يكره الخير ولما ينفع حربير ويزرع يزرع فلان الكل يستفيد يعني You cannot stop a bird from flying across a certain border. You cannot stop the water to flow, you know, across borders. The demise of the Jordan River is very much connected to the conflict. Only 2% of the historical flow is left in the so-called mighty Jordan. How deep is that river? How deep is that river? I don't want to know where it's coming from. I don't need to know where it's going to. Before I place my trust in you, I just want to know how deep. Christians, they, Jesus, was baptized in the river. The uh, Jewish, they looked upon the promised land across the river. The Muslims, so many of the Prophet Muhammad companions uh, buried by the banks of the river. Every single heavenly religion talked about water. I don't need to know if it's safe to swim Before I put my trust in him I just want to know how deep Half these people I've baptized at Lake Mead and they've traveled from Las Vegas all the way over here and it's just magnificent. It is holy water. I was baptized as a baby, but that was just a symbol. This is real. Yardinit was created because it's the only site left where there is real fresh water flowing in that three kilometer stretch of the Jordan River. But legend tells us that the real baptism of Christ is here. Here, there has been pollution released from hundreds of thousands of residents, Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli, that live along its banks. I wouldn't go into this water knowing what we know. It's really unbelievable what we have done to a river holy to half of humanity. What we see here is the raw sewerage of some 15,000 Israeli residents around the Sea of Galilee dumped here. The people, especially the religious Christian, they don't know that this is the water that the goes source. to the baptism site. Imagine yani, if the people knew. On water, we must cooperate. It's not an issue of doing a favor to the other side. It's an issue of self-interest. And the fact that the water resources are shared makes it mutual interest. Let's go, let's go. Okay, what, what We've been able to call out to our decision makers, to speak in our respective parliaments, that this is unacceptable. There are certain issues that cannot wait for the politicians to solve their differences and then look at the water situation. And by the end of next year, There'll be no raw sewage emitted from the Israeli side. Next, we still need to continue pushing the Jordanian and the Palestinian Authority to further build sewage yep. systems. Yeah. This is the, just the beginning. Being in the Middle East, if you are not optimistic, you will have a heart attack. The worst case scenario basin is the Jordan Basin. 
If the Jordan can work out their water crisis in the absence of violence, certainly California can. Certainly other basins around the world can. I don't want to know if it's yours or mine. I just want to know how deep. There's no doubt that humanity is capable of screwing things up. There's also no doubt in my mind that we're capable of fixing things when what we're screwing up is really important to us. The more we know, the more likely we are to do the right things. And in the end, we, you do what you can. And you trust in the ability of people to learn. Porcelain springs, water from the most peaceful place on Earth. It's going to be about Western survival, and we'll want to fight, but we can't. We can't afford that war. It is not clear to me that we can reverse the situation. We certainly are not going to be reversing climate change. We can take steps to ensure that there's a sustainable water supply over a much longer period of time. It's not a solvable problem, but it's truly a manageable problem. But we need to start addressing it now. I tell people all the time, I'm still a little boy who likes frogs. We're losing species faster than we ever have before. We think that we're here forever, but all species go extinct. But that doesn't mean we have to speed it along and, and continue on track the way that we're doing. This isn't going to be resolved tomorrow. It's just not. But look what you have done. The EPA they are going to finally set a standard for hexavalent chromium in drinking water. So we've made some progress. I got a phone call and a lady on the other end says, congratulations, Lynn, you've been chosen to, for the Goldman Prize. And that's kind of, yeah, right, you know? So I looked it up, and I'm like, wow, they do exist. I mean, I'd been on a plane once in my life, and it was like uh, being Dorothy on The Wizard of Oz. When I went to reach to shake his hand, he says, hi, Lynn. Did you kiss the president? He kissed me. Oh, really? How about <laughs> I wonder how many of these people, and we started out 10 years ago, said we was wasting their time. I wonder what they're thinking now. My two-year-old granddaughter deserves to grow up in a clean world. I hope you'll join me in our fight. When you see it all at once, that becomes the eye opener. There's a common agenda for all of us for every walk of life. And that's water. We might find ourselves in a pivotal moment here where we can do the right thing. I always feel hopeful that things work out where everything converges at once. Maybe that moment's happening now.
Don't you turn this around I have not touched the ground And I don't know how long You say to Walk it back Walk it back 